<clears throat> so uh, this is uh, the information on Winterham 2023 travel. Uh, we're very excited about the slate of trips that we have ahead of us. And so my goal today is just to talk a little bit about those. Uh, first off, I want to start with our theme verse for Winterum, which is God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. Uh, this is kind of our verse for all of Winterum, but it applies to Winterum travel. Um, you know, the goal of these trips is to allow students to not only, you know, develop, but also to discover those spiritual gifts in ways that maybe they don't get to in the regular classroom. Uh, students learn that they are leaders uh, amongst groups of people that they don't normally spend time with. Um, they're collaborators. They learn that they have perseverance when things get a little bit tough. Um, there's a lot of maturity that goes into travel. Some of these trips are very discipline specific. And so the gifts come in handy there. Uh, and we use them to serve one another. And we every year look to make sure that we have service trips available um, in addition to some of our trips, which maybe are not fully service trips, but do have service components. And that gets us really to kind of the, the three things we look for in all of our Winterham experiences. Whenever I meet with guest instructors and whenever we talk about Winterham travel, our hope is that we, we kind of find the sweet spot in the middle of these three circles. So we hope that our trips um, definitely, you know, have curricular connections. Some of them are very specific to certain disciplines. Others are just more broadly uh, developing students as learners and um, kind of learning their cultural awareness in new situations. Uh, we hope that our trips, because they're led by our staff, uh, continue to challenge students in their faith and get them to think about um, things beyond themselves, uh, how they work with groups and love their neighbors uh, and experience more of God's creation. And then with school culture, um, I know as a classroom teacher that the week after Winterum is so fun because students come back just buzzing with all kinds of stories and pictures, and it's really something that uh, brings the school together. And so um, we look for all three of these things whenever we put together our Winterum slate of trips. And it seems like it's working. Um, <clears throat> these are some responses from last year's trips. Um, they just kind of highlight some of the things that I just talked about. Uh, the first one uh, was from one of our trips that went uh, down south, and it said there were a lot of opportunities to practice Spanish. And this wasn't a Spanish-specific trip, um, but they did go to a Spanish-speaking country. And so this student realized that uh, they had that opportunity, and it said every day we did something new and interesting. Uh, another student responded to their travel experience last year saying, I grew closer to God and grew closer to people in my grade. And I immediately read that and I think our calling is to love the Lord and love our neighbor. And it seems like, you know, we're hopefully fostering some of those experiences uh, when we take students, you know, around the world. And then the third one, and these are the ones that always make me the most excited. Whenever I get the uh, evaluations back, uh, I feel like we're doing something really great when we hear students say things like, I appreciated the small group of people that we had because it allowed us to get closer together and become a family. And that is one of our goals with Winter and Travel. We do keep these trips uh, on the smaller side so that students can get to know people, uh, maybe that they don't normally spend time with in the school, uh, and they get to really know them when they spend 24 hours a day with those people. And so uh, those are exciting things to read about, and we anticipate a lot more comments like that after this batch of trips. When it comes to this batch of trips, um, <clears throat> I'm extremely excited. We're maybe not as geographically diverse as we've been in some years. Uh, I sometimes brag, although I'm not totally responsible since I wasn't the first winter coordinator, um, but we have been to six of the seven continents. Um, and Catherine Deacon and uh, Larry Borst tried to get to the seventh this year. They went about as far south as, as we've ever been uh, and so when I look at these trips and I think about the variety of disciplines that they cover, um, the, the variety of cost uh, points that they try to hit, and just the, the variety of experiences that students forget, uh, I think it's just a fantastic group. And so we hope students, uh, you know, kind of see the benefit in each of them. Um, <clears throat> now I just want to get to some of the nuts and bolts. Uh, and so 
one of the first things I'll talk about here is safety and expectations. When it comes to interim travel, uh, one of the things that we know that travel does is it, you know, fosters maturity in students. Um, but that's also maybe one of the things we challenge parents to think about and students to think about before they go. Uh, is your student ready for winter and travel? Now, in order to make that decision, there's some things that it might help to know. Uh, first of all, all of our trip leaders are GHS staff members. Uh, we do have some additional chaperones that might not be on staff, but every single one of them does uh, end up getting background checked and they are um, people who the staff leaders have chosen who they think will help benefit the group. Um, so you do know that when your students are traveling, they're traveling with people who are regularly in charge of them during the day. And so uh, hopefully that instills a little bit of confidence. Um, we also uh, try to ensure that our trips have a very good student to adult ratio. It says 10 to 1. Um, that's probably on the high end. A lot of our uh, international trips actually adhere closer to a six to one ratio. And so when your students are traveling, there's uh, never situations where they should feel like, you know, there's, there's uh, not a great deal of control because we hopefully have enough adults present and there's never too much of a concern there. We also uh, really, you know, make this clear on the contracts and in trip meetings heading into travel that the GRCHS code of conduct applies. Uh, and so all the rules that we expect of our students in the classroom, uh, you know, we hope for on these trips. Uh, and so trip leaders will communicate whatever specific things they have for their trips as well. Um, but as a general rule, know that, you know, the safety that you expect of your students in our building is the same kind of thing we hope for all around the world. Um, but whether or not, you know, your student is responsible for travel or not, um, the next point kind of is one to, oh, wait, and then the contract, sorry. Uh, we do have students all sign contracts in order to agree to those uh, terms. Um, but then it comes uh, down to student responsibility. Um, for most of the trips, travel documents and all forms are the student's responsibility. Um, some trip leaders might collect passports if they're going to a place where they're, you know, worried that passports might disappear. But overall, uh, students need to make sure that they get their passports submitted on time. Um, we put the kind of uh, expectation on students and families to ensure that any visas that might be necessary, especially for our international students, uh, are taken care of. Um, eventually, you and your students will need to ensure that there's a notarized letter where you, you know, are signing off that you are allowing your student to head off and travel you know, with our staff. Um, and all of this stuff generally gets communicated um, to students. Uh, and so this is where we tell students all the time, you should be checking your email regularly. You might be getting messages about your upcoming trip. Don't miss deadlines. Uh, and so when you think about whether your student's ready for winter and travel, that's maybe one thing to, to factor in. Um, we do try to make sure that all of our trips, um, you know, hit all the requirements necessary when it comes to um, vaccinations. Uh, we, and I really push all of our trip leaders to explore insurance possibilities for our trips. And they'll communicate all of that because it is trip by trip dependent. Um, when it comes to vaccinations, um, we really turn to the nations and the partner organizations that we are working with. And so each trip, especially when it comes to changing COVID requirements. Um, the trip leaders will be able to communicate what they know now, um, but we also know that over the last two years, uh, sometimes, you know, that's a bit of a moving target. And so uh, we will, you know, kind of let you know what we know and then, uh, you know, continue to keep you updated as things may or may not change. And then on the trips, um, we do hope that students will have the responsibility to use some free time. Um, trips are usually pretty busy, I think, um, but there might be times when students are allowed to explore, you know, areas. They're probably given a, a set area. Uh, and so, you know, think about whether your student is ready for winter and travel. Can they handle uh, a little bit of free time, maybe in a, a new city or a new place, um, as long as you know that the, the leaders are communicating exactly where to meet up and, and how to get a hold of them at any time. Uh, and I already mentioned this, but students are responsible for email correspondence with leaders. I think our trip leaders still do 
you know, email parents when things are, you know, really important, but a lot of that communication will happen during focus periods and through student Gmail accounts. And so uh, just some things to think about before you sign up. Of course, before you sign up, you'll also want to think about trip costs and payments. Um, the first thing we try to do, and the reason why this meeting is now and not in October, is because we try to sign up for trips early so that we can spread those prices out. That will depend on the trip. Uh, every trip will have its own kind of payment schedule. Um, some of the trips that are working through travel companies, uh, that schedule will be decided by the company itself. Others, um, we wonderfully have our central office partner with us to tie those payment schedules to our smart tuition accounts. Uh, and so that's an option for families. Um, it all begins with a non-refundable down payment of 10% of the trip costs that will happen with trip enrollment. And so roughly two weeks from now, when those contracts start coming in, uh, there'll be a digital form where you can also submit that uh, trip deposit. And then the, the rest of the payments, um, like I said, are sometimes set up with travel companies, sometimes set up with our school's tuition, um, or we have some families that request to just make monthly payments, and we have a website where you can do that digitally as well. Uh, the key is with all the trips, uh, they end up getting paid somewhere between 60 and 35 days prior to departure. So uh, if you're thinking about, you know, the price and, you know, the time of year, you might know that, you know, these do get spread out over the next several months. We also uh, really try to, to make Wintrum travel as accessible as possible. And, and our school has been really generous uh, in putting aside some financial aid for Wintrum travel. Uh, and so, yes, financial aid is available for Wintrum trips. Uh, the way this works is, I think this evening sometime, otherwise first thing tomorrow morning, Every student in the school will get an email, which has a, uh, you know, I'm an interested in traveling form. And that's where they'll sign up saying, hey, I just would like to be a part of a trip. It's not where they choose a trip. And one of the things on that form will also be a box to apply for financial aid. Uh, and so uh, what that means is when students apply for financial aid, I send that information off to central office and then they let me know um, you know, which students end up being eligible for that. Um, we do give financial aid priority for students that have not used Winterim aid before. And so if your student traveled as a sophomore and received some financial aid, there's not a guarantee that they'll get it, you know, on a second trip. Um, however, we sometimes do find ways to uh, still ensure that some of those students get some. How do you do this? Well, if your family receives or applied for GRCS tuition aid for this school year, um, all you have to do is check that box. And Mr. Primus at Central Office has all the information he needs. If not, when you check that box, it will ask you to email Jim Primus and put Winterim aid in the subject line and send a copy of your most recent tax return, just the 1040 page. Uh, and from there, he'll be able to, uh, you know, instruct me on exactly what your family is eligible for. The way that works is we then um, email all the students who apply uh, a financial aid dollar amount that they then can decide which trip they would like to go on based on. So your financial aid will be a dollar amount. It won't be like a percentage of the trip. And so, for example's sake, um, you apply for financial aid. A week from now, I email you and say, congratulations, you're approved to travel. And we have granted you, let's say, $300 in aid. And so then you can choose whether or not that makes, you know, a $3,000 trip more feasible or maybe, you know, one of the lesser expensive trips more feasible. Uh, and so the bonus there is, you know, your financial aid before you choose which trip you are interested in going on. In addition to financial aid, uh, we do try to uh, generate some opportunities for students to raise some money. Um, that said, we probably do a little less than this than you know, we have done in the past, um, but we do want to try to make that winter trip possible. Uh, the best way for students to do this is hourly summerly, summer work at New to You. Uh, for those unfamiliar, New to You is the school's thrift store. And so during the months of June, July, and August, they will make shifts available for students to come in and 
vacuum, clean, um, sort clothes, break down furniture, carry things, do all kinds of uh, you know odd jobs. They also will uh, offer up Friday afternoon share shifts where students can come in and work and earn a percentage of the till. And so these are great opportunities for students and in some cases their parents to sign up uh, and earn some money for those winter home trips. Occasional opportunities do arise. Um, sometimes trip leaders actually create fundraising opportunities. Um, however, uh, those will come out you know, through emails to the trips or through the morning announcements. I will, however, take this time to also make a plug. Our custodial staff has regularly been looking for students uh, you know, to work after school. Uh, and so I do know that if uh, students are looking to make some extra money for Windrum, not a bad plan to maybe uh, reach out to Mr. Piper and see if there's something available there because that would be a convenient way to uh, not only work right at school after school, uh, but also to make some money for these trips. All right, so uh, the timeline. Uh, we let the, uh, release the trips uh, you know, just before spring break. Uh, and so now we're here learning about them and, and the process uh, and that will lead us up till a week from today where students forms to apply for winter travel and to apply for financial aid will be due. Uh, they're due at 3 p.m. next Thursday and I will close that form at 3 p.m. Uh, and then that's the group of students that I will then send out trip selection forms to um, sometime early that next week after Mr. Primus has had a chance to let me know all the financial aid information. Uh, and so every year there are students who come to me panicking on the 28th saying, wait, all my friends are signing up for trips. Why can't I? And that's when I say, well, it's because you didn't fill in the form that was due on the 21st. Uh, and so this is where, again, keep reminding your students, now is the time, of, well, every time is the time of the year to be checking your email regularly. Um, but now, especially, keep an eye open for, uh, you know, all the things that are tied to winter and travel. That application process, as I said, um, will open tomorrow. It may even open tonight if I can get this video recording and everything kind of set up and sent out. Uh, and then that'll close next week, Thursday at 3 p.m. It is an online form. I will put this form in the morning announcements. It will get emailed to all students and will make its way onto the winter and website sometime the next day or two. And the key to this form, as I said earlier, is just general readiness for travel. Uh, and so what happens is students answer a bunch of questions. You know, why are you excited to travel for winter? Have you traveled before? Um, what things make you nervous about winter travel? Uh, who's a teacher who knows you well, who can maybe vouch for your maturity level? Um, things like that. Uh, these forms are only accessible through student accounts. Um, again, we're trying to teach students maturity. And so uh, we try to make it so that they're the only ones who can complete it. And so when I get that email from a, a mom or a dad saying, hey, I'm trying to do this form, why can't I? Well, it's because hopefully you're sitting down with your student in order to do that. Uh, those applications are then reviewed by trip leaders, administrators, and guidance counselors. And that is the place, again, where you uh, apply for financial aid. I do encourage you to do this with your students, um, but again, it can only be done from student Gmail accounts. As I said, after uh, those forms are completed and students get the email told that how much financial aid they'll be granted, um, they also get a form where they get to rank the trips that they are interested in. And trip selection is based on seniority and then a lottery. We try to make it as fair as possible. And so students will be able to rank up to five trips if they are really excited about five different options. Uh, and they'll place them, you know, my first choice, my second choice, my third choice, my fourth choice, my fifth choice. We do really stress you only select the trips that you are actually interested in signing up for. Um, sometimes students are like, well, I put five, but I didn't think, you know, I really would go past number one. And the reality is sometimes you don't get your first choice. And so, you know, just ranking the ones you're only excited about is best. And so then I look through that form and I first uh, sort it according to just the seniors. And I put all the seniors that I can into their first choice. And if a trip were to fill and not every senior would get their first choice in that trip, then I would draw names out of a hat to find out which seniors get that very popular trip. 
and then we would start enrolling the, you know, them into their second choices. And we work on down through the juniors and then the sophomores. Um, like I said, names are randomly drawn and then placed in their most uh, preferred trip that still has room if necessary. One of the things I really stress here is sometimes students think there's a game to be played here. They think, well, I didn't actually want that trip as my first choice, but I thought that another one might fill up first. So I put this other one as my, just rank them one through five in the order you would like them and you will get your highest priority trip if possible. Uh, again, you can do up to five trips. And this is also the form that I use to create a waiting list if an opening does happen down the line. Now, once trip rosters are set, we stop kind of the trickle down effect. And so if, you know, a month from now, a student ends up dropping out of a trip, I might go to the waiting list. I won't go and look through all the, you know, students who had that as their second choice and, and create a big kind of mayhem trickle down effect from there. Um, but it does help to, you know, kind of be on that waiting list in the, in the off chance that you don't get any of your choices and a, and a spot opens later. All right. Um, in order to keep your spot, once you are on a trip roster, you will then complete an enrollment contract. Um, these are all digital. There's a bunch of boxes that you will check. And then uh, after you have done all of those, um, you will uh, submit that information digitally along with a non-refundable deposit of 10% of the total cost of the trip. Um, some of the trips have a travel company that will also accept the deposit. And so trip leaders will communicate with you. Some of them will collect half through the travel company, half through this form. Some of them will you know, collect all through the travel company. And so uh, that's something that'll be kind of made clear in the breakout rooms in a moment or two. Um, if there are additional online processes that need to happen with those travel companies, um, that trip, uh, trip leaders will communicate that at that time. Those contracts are due by May 5th at 3 p.m. Uh, in order to hold your spot. And so if we have a bunch of people who haven't handed them in by 3 p.m., well, that's where that waiting list suddenly becomes a factor. All right. I hope I didn't speak too quickly. Um, got wrapped up in the 25 minutes or so that I was hoping for. And this gives us a little bit of time to break uh, you know, people into the breakout rooms. And so trip leaders, you can try to head there right now. Um, before I send the rest of you off though, if you have any questions, um, please don't hesitate to email me at bkarsten at grcs.org. Unless there are questions about specific trips and the itinerary and things like that, that maybe you don't get in these meetings, uh, those questions are probably best served for individual trip leaders. And so just shoot an email off to them and they'd be happy to answer all of those as well. All right. Uh, we're even a tad early, which is fantastic. It gives people a couple minutes to get there. So for those of you who are uh, you know, not particularly comfortable with Zoom, uh, I believe at the bottom of your screen, you should have an option to choose a breakout rooms button. You can click on that and then up will come a screen where you will see all the different trips available to you. Um, at that point, you may choose a trip that you are interested in hearing a little bit more information about. And I've instructed the trip leaders to kind of talk for seven or eight minutes, leave two or three minutes for questions, and then make sure that they tell the first group that their time is up and then uh, everybody can maybe go and head out, check out a second trip as well. Uh, and so it gives you a chance to maybe ask questions about two different trips. If you have questions about more than two trips, by all means, don't hesitate to email that third group of trip, trip leaders uh, and they would love to share any information possible. All right, I'm going to stop recording because at this point, nothing else is interesting.